Direct drive for everyone. That's how Fanatec are describing the new CSL DD sim racing wheelbase. Now, that is a big statement, but it does look to be an important product that's aggressively positioned in the marketplace and aggressively priced. And I think it's fair to say that Fanatec are embodying the go big or go home mentality. So, which is it? Hello, fellow sim racers. This is going to be a long video since there's a lot of stuff to cover, so I've put timestamps in the video description so you can navigate around and skip any of the parts that aren't relevant to you. And do hit the subscribe button to catch my video on the new CSL pedals, as well as a roundup of all of the community questions about these two new offerings from Fanatec. Fanatec have sent me pre-production versions of the new CSL Direct Drive Wheel and CSL Pedals, and since these aren't the completely finalized retail spec models, there are a couple of caveats before we get into it. First of all, this sample of the Direct Drive Wheelbase doesn't have the production specification quick release assembly, so Fanatec have asked that I only use the wheel that's been provided. So with that in mind, I won't be talking about the quick release at all, since there's nothing useful I can say about it beyond the fact that it, it has one. The final caveat, and this is super important, this video shouldn't be viewed as a review. It's an early access look at some cool tech that's coming out soon. Fanatec caused a bit of a stir with the announcement of the CSL Direct Drive Wheel, and if you know your sim racing apples, it's easy to see why. Historically speaking, Direct Drive Wheels were as complex as they were expensive, but they were also in a league of their own when it came to performance and immersion. Over the years, they've become more user-friendly, but the cost of getting into the game is still fairly high. So, enter the Fanatec CSLDD, a direct drive wheelbase at comparable prices to the better belt-driven wheels. If you're relatively new to sim racing, then you may wonder why that matters. And in a sentence or two, direct drive wheels utilize a motor that's directly connected to the steering wheel itself, while other, more budget-friendly wheels use a gear train or a belt drive. Direct drive wheels feel more direct, they accelerate faster and can handle more torque, which gives the driver a much better sense of what the car is doing in the racing sim. So direct drive wheels are well, they're where it's at. And to give you some context as to why people are getting excited about the new CSL DD in particular, well, the price starts at 350 euros, while the next most uh, affordable model from Fanatec is 1200 euros. And when you add into the equation the plug and play nature of Fanatec's product line and its relative ease of use, setup and compatibility with consoles, then yeah, you can see why this is kind of a big deal. The CSL DD comes as standard with a 90 watt power supply that's capable of providing five Newton meters of torque. And that can be upgraded to eight Newton meters with the optional power supply called the Boost Kit 180. I have both of these here, so I'll be comparing the performance later on in the video. The motor features a carbon fiber composite shaft, which other than sounding pretty badass also helps reduce the rotational mass. What that means in plain English is that the motor has to work less hard to rotate your wheel, meaning quicker acceleration and snappier force feedback. But we will have to take their word for it since there's no way to compare against an identical wheel with a traditional metal shaft. The outer body is designed as one giant heatsink because the CSL DD is passively cooled, which is actually really nice to see. Cooling fans introduce another potential failure point and they also suck in dust, which really should be left out in the wild. It, it doesn't do well in captivity. As for thermal performance, I've tested this multiple times with my infrared thermometer and with an ambient temperature in the studio of around 24 degrees C, the highest peak temperature I've recorded on the wheelbase is about 40. There are rails on the bottom and the side of the CSL DD that are built into the cooling fins, and these will accept 40 series T-nuts like you'd find on an aluminium extrusion rig, and Fanatec have provided four of them. This allows much more flexibility with mounting than the usual pre-drilled and threaded holes that are typical on most sim racing wheels. Before we move on to the build and, of course, the driving, there are a couple of other things to note with the specification. As you would expect, there's connectivity for various Fanatec accessories, which helps with the console compatibility, and it cuts down on USB ports needed for PC users. Speaking of which, the CSL DD features a Type-C connector for the data connection, which I think might be a first, and if not, they're still ahead of the iPhone. 
The quick release, which I said I wouldn't mention, is wired into the wheelbase via USB-C, and it's going to be user upgradable in the future, which is good to know as Fanatec have been teasing their new QR2 quick release standard for quite a while now. I should also mention console compatibility. As has been the case with some Fanatec products in the past, the CSWDD will work on the Xbox platform as long as you have an appropriate Xbox wheel attached. There will be a PlayStation compatible version coming in the future, just like with the DD1, but the CSLDD is not PlayStation compatible. This is an annoyance, but my understanding is that this is a legal licensing kind of thing from the console manufacturers, rather than any deliberate decision by Fanatec. The first thing that strikes you about the CSLDD is its small size, and that is a definite bonus if you like to have your wheelbase right up in front of your screen. The center section of the wheelbase is formed from a machined aluminium extrusion, which acts as both the main chassis for the wheel and the heatsink for the motor. And in this cutaway, you can clearly see those mounting rails. Honestly, it all feels pretty rugged to me, and as mentioned earlier, that heatsink has worked like a champ throughout testing. The front and rear sections are made from an injection molded plastic, but it is tough and it feels very durable to me. But at the end of the day, it's still plastic, so I probably wouldn't advise dropping it. On the front, you'll find an on-off switch, which also functions as the mode switch, allowing you to change between compatibility modes that may be helpful with older titles or console games. The connection hookups around the back are sturdy, as you would expect, and mounted into the chassis, with the now familiar Fanatec RJ12 accessory connectors and a pair of USB Type-Cs. Finally, before we move on to the interesting stuff, i.e. the driving, let's talk mounting. I was able to slot this straight onto my B-Rig, which is a SimLab GT1 Evo without any drama. The T-nuts can be aligned to meet the normal Fanatec 3-bolt pattern, so in theory this should easily mount to any rig that was designed with a Fanatec wheel in mind, without you needing to get the drill. Now, if you don't have a dedicated rig, then Fanatec have produced a desk clamp which slides into those rails and securely holds the wheelbase tight as you tighten down the locking clamp onto your desk. Now, it's important to bear in mind that this is a table clamp and it does have limitations. And while it did seem to do an impressive job in context of holding the CSLDD steady under testing, it's obviously not going to be as solid as a dedicated rig. And I did detect a small amount of flex in the unit back and forth. But again, this isn't a retail spec part and Fanatec have said that the final version should perform better than this. Still, I think for what it is, it does a good job. I've had this pre-production unit for about two weeks in total, and I've put it to work across what I believe are the five most popular PC sims, with both the standard power supply and the boost kit. I was initially tempted to break this down on a sim by sim basis, but honestly, my notes for each one of them said pretty similar things, so I'm going to give a broad strokes overview and highlight any sim specific things that I've encountered. Now, it's important to mention that force feedback feel in particular is incredibly subjective, and the terms used to describe it are about as far away from empirical as it's possible to get. So to keep things vaguely comparable, I kept all of my wheelbase settings identical between the sims, and largely tried to keep the sim settings as default as possible, even though this isn't how you would behave with the sims and wheel in real life. As standard with the 90 watt power supply, the feel is responsive and nuanced across every sim that I tested. It felt better than any gear or belt driven wheels I've driven over the years, and honestly that's not that surprising. I've driven plenty of direct drive wheels with the power turned down, and that's really sort of what it feels like, and that's probably the best compliment that I can give it. Compared to the DD1 or my Simucube 2 at similar settings, I'm really not sure that I'd be able to tell the difference in a blind test. But that's not all that helpful unless you have a room full of wheels, and compared to similar belt wheels that you may be more familiar with, there is, well, a much bigger difference. You can very much feel the responsiveness, that snappy acceleration of the wheel that makes feeling the grip limit and catching the car that much easier. On top of that, you don't feel any mechanical resistance when there isn't supposed to be any, so when the steering goes light during one of those oh shit moments, it really does go light. And the other area that it excels compared to belt wheels is in the self-aligning feel, the importance of which really can't be overstated. Moving on to the boost kit, and this actually really surprised me. Perhaps this is due to my inability to comprehend single digit numbers, but I really wasn't prepared for how much difference the extra 3 Nm of torque would actually make. 
The main one, of course, is that everything I just described gets 60% stronger, increasing the peak torque and also the dynamic range, or the difference between the smallest and the largest forces in your force feedback. In a word, more is, in fact, better. And you really feel that in the self-alignment of the steering, which is always an important factor to me. It's also important for those with an interest in driving sideways, so this is definitely the more appropriate setup for drifters and dirt guys. Fanatec tell me that their data suggests that most users of their high-end direct drive wheels tend to stick to the 8 to 10 newton meter range for most sims. And that gels with my own experience, and I certainly do tend to stick in that range most of the time. The 8 newton meters provided by the boost kit really does feel like enough for really most situations. And that got me wondering how many people really need any more than that. It certainly provides strong steering forces, and in high aero cars where the steering really does load up, it's plenty heavy feeling as well. So for me, the CSL DD with the boost kit ticks a lot of the boxes in both the driving dynamics and immersion categories. Though if you want true one-to-one -one steering column torque values in pre-power steering era cars, then you're gonna need something a bit beefier. Now, as for sim-specific behavior, there are a couple of notes. With Raceroom, I tested both the current force feedback system and the preview of the upcoming new system, which is a ground up reworking. And honestly, the difference was night and day. I struggled to get a good feel on the old system as I have with, well, most of my other direct drive wheels. And the new system, well, it just worked and was fantastic. I can tell you that eight newton meters in the Formula Raceroom 90 feels really great. It's a squirmy car that needs to be hustled and really does feel much better on direct drive wheels. And this felt really right to me. And that's the same case for iRacing to some extent where I've struggled a bit without IRFFB and specifically it's seat of the pants setting which really does help you seek out the grip limit. This is even more useful with the standard 90 watt power supply where you don't get the more fierce self-aligning forces afforded by the extra torque. I did test the CSL DD with R Factor 2, but failed to get any of it on film after I encountered some stability issues. Now, I have no reason to believe that's anything to do with the wheel though. I've not had RF2 installed on this rig before, so honestly, it could be any number of things, though I'm guessing it's a video driver issue based on the nature of the crashes. Something to bear in mind with all of these comments is that it's not all about power. At 5 newton meters, the CSL DD transmits a lot more information than a similarly powered belt wheel. This is as much about nuanced detail as it is about raw torque. And the reality is the CSL DD at any power level is fundamentally more reactive than any indirect drive wheels that we've seen. So while the torque figure is worth considering, it's the fidelity that makes the difference in my opinion. And to some extent, that's why a video like this is a bit weird to make. Due to the price point, I have to compare this wheel to products that are just fundamentally different, and frankly, technologically inferior. So realistically, of course I'm going to say this blows your old G-Series wheel out of the water. It's like putting David Hay in the ring with Chris Hay. Sure, the names are similar, but there's really not a lot else in common. So then, does the Fanatec CSL DD bring direct drive to the masses? Is it the new standard with 2Ds? Well, it definitely sets new standards for the price point. That much is undeniable. And I suspect it will fly off of the shelves. So I guess the former is true as well, to an extent. But I think the point that I want to make here is that the CSL DD isn't just good at the price point. It's, it's good full stop. In its standard configuration, it's a big step up from what the competitors are offering. And with the boost kit, I'd argue that it's snapping at the heels of more expensive offerings from both Fanatec and their rivals. Now, I'm not saying that this is as good as a DD1, but it is much closer to a high-end direct drive system than it is to an entry-level belt or gear-driven wheel available down at the other end of the market. So with all of that in mind, where does the CSL DD fit into the sim racing market? I guess from a price comparison perspective, the competitors would have been the now discontinued Club Sport V 2.5 wheel from Fanatec and the Thrustmaster TSPC racer, and I'm pretty confident that the CSL DD is the clear winner in this category. Though, as is always the case, it does get a bit messy depending on the accessories you choose, particularly with wheels in Fanatec's case, so direct comparisons are difficult. 
Another aspect to consider is that while the wheelbase is a scant 350 euros, you do still need to buy a wheel rim and potentially pedals as well if you're new or if you're moving into the Fanatec ecosystem for the first time. Do watch my video on the new CSL pedals, by the way. Anyway, realistically, this should perhaps be considered as a mid-range product rather than true entry level. So then the other big question that I keep being asked is, should I upgrade from X? And well, that's difficult to answer. I think the simplest way of putting it is that if you plan on moving from a say sub 400 euro wheelbase, then the CSL DD will be a clear and substantial upgrade. Frankly, it'll be like night and day compared to a Logitech G wheel or something like a T300, especially if you can find the budget for the boost kit as well. If you're already in the mid-range with something like a CSW V2.5 or a TSPC, then you will enjoy the extra fidelity and reactivity, but you'll almost certainly want the boost kit to make sure you're getting a modest power increase as well, rather than a small cut in some cases, compared to what you already have. This isn't going to give you that same night and day difference as, as the other category, but it will be an improvement in both driving feel and immersion. The final comparison then has to be to higher end systems. Should you spend an extra nine to 1500 euros on a DD1, a DD2, or something like a SimuCube? And, and that's even tougher. Personally, I think the CSL DD with the boost kit gets you reasonably close, but not quite all of the way there. So like with any high-end gear, be it hi-fi, cameras, computers, or whatever, that law of diminishing returns kicks in hard the more you spend. And frankly, the CSL DD has moved that curve just a little bit higher. So I can't answer this question for you. If you have to have the best of the best, then you probably won't be satisfied with a CSL DD, but I suspect 90% of sim racers will. And with that all being said, I think it's worth reminding everyone that I've been dealing with a pre-production unit here. And whilst Fanatec assure me that the performance is comparable to the retail version, let's all keep cool heads. I, for one, am keen to try out the proper spec quick release once the production models start to land. And then there are things like the firmware, which isn't ready for public release, as you would expect at this stage. We saw with both the DD1 and DD2 that firmware tweaks really helped bring out some nice performance and quality of life improvements as their development went on. So I think it'd be silly of me to presume that the alpha firmware that I have here is going to be anything like what's available at the launch. And that's why I haven't really mentioned it up until this point. Now, these are the prices. I'm not going to get into any discussions about value here because, as always, that's really subjective. And my opinion isn't going to sway you one way or another. What I will say, though, is that the full setup with the boost kit comes in cheaper than the old CSW V2.5 that it's replacing. And that's actually a little surprising to me. If you want to get your hands on one, Fanatec are opening up pre-orders uh, this week, which isn't very specific, I'll grant you. And at the time of recording this, I have no idea whether I need to be talking in the past, present, or future tense. Pre-orders will be limited to one per customer. And there will be three phases of pre-orders. The first wave will only be available to existing Fanatec customers that have purchased from the web store before. Wave two will be for customers with a pre-existing Fanatec web store account or newsletter subscription. And wave three will be open to the wider public. This is a great move by Fanatec that should ensure that genuine sim racers will be able to get their hands on the product first and keep them out of the hands of scalpers. So then that just about brings us to the end of this preview. Thanks to everyone that voted for me in the Fanatec poll. I was really bowled over by all of the support. And on that note, I guess what it's left to say is goodbye. Thank you for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.